So what's wrong with you guys? You don't like uh, aortic stenosis? There are much less of you than in the previous ones. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Quinones, also known as Dr. Q. Um, we got, I have two talks side by side. Dr. Kalmeyer was supposed to start, but she and another one of the faculties uh, went to the SASA. So I just text them and they're on their way back. So it, everything should work just fine. Um, so I'm going to do the aortic stenosis and aortic regurg side by side, and then that will give time to Dr. Karmeyer to make it in here for her talk, and that will put us back in rhythm. Okay, so aortic stenosis. How many of you have seen someone with aortic stenosis? Hope everybody gets their hands up. Okay. So this, there's no such thing as acute aortic stenosis. You don't have to remember that one because it doesn't exist. It's always a chronic disease. And uh, the etiology is rheumatic. Practically, we never see anymore. It is always accompanied by MS. And most of the time, it's mild. Rarely do you have a severe MS, severe AS, unless it's somebody coming from the Middle East. But in the US, practically, we have stopped seeing that. So you're going to be dealing with basically calcific or congenital. Calcific being very common nowadays because of people getting older and having a lot of calcific AS. The bicuspid valve is basically a defective valve that unless it's extremely small at birth, it just takes decades to gradually degenerate and develop either AS, AI, or both. Classic teaching is 40 to 60. However, now that we're doing a lot of TAVARs in elderly people, we're finding with CT and whatnot that there, there are a bunch of 85-year-olds with congenital bicuspid valves. So that classic teaching is becoming a lot more elastic uh, because of the fact that we can do much better imaging now, nowadays. Um, congenital group by cuspid, by cuspid, by cuspid. Once in a while, you see a quadricuspid. When you do, you take a picture of it because it may be the only one you see in your life. Um, if we practice adult uh, medicine, you won't see unicuspid. That's a disease of very young kids. They're very sick. They're infants. They, they, they need a lot of care. You might see them after the facts when they become adults and, and had um, some procedure done. How do we look at the aortic valve? Echo, echo, echo is 99%. However, echo has its problems. So echo is very good to differentiate normal, abnormal, thickened, maybe calcified, doesn't move too good. When you get down to planimetry of the aortic valve orifice, transthoracic is really not very good. TEE is a little bit better, but probably today we rely a lot more when we need it on CMR, and even CT uh, can be very helpful. It's a chronic disease. It's like taking your water hose and gradually pinching it, pinching it, pinching it. So you reduce the orifice, what happens? You increase the velocity of water passing through, therefore the velocity of blood passing through increases. That's what we do by echo Doppler. And you also increase the pressure gradient, higher pressure in the ventricle, lower in the aorta. So you get this phenomenon, right, where you have a higher LV pressure, a lower aortic pressure in the central aorta, and a gradient, okay? Now, very important aspect of heart cath, if you're going to cast somebody for aortic stenosis, which nowadays we tend to do less because we have so many other non-invasive ways of looking at it, but if you do it, you have to do it well. So to put a catheter in the LV and a catheter in the femoral artery is atrocious. It should be, it should go to a, a uh, lawsuit because your peripheral pressure increases and therefore your gradient is much less and you may make some major mistakes. So if you're going to do it, you have to get LV and central aorta, either by having two catheters or a double lumen catheter or doing a very careful pullback. But if you're going to do a gradient, it has to be done well. P particularly in the elderly where peripheral pressures tend to increase a lot more than in the younger patients. Now, because you have a gradient and you have a higher velocity of blood passing through the valve, you have a murmur. And it's typically a systolic ejection murmur. If the AS is very severe, the ejection time prolongs. And with that, the second heart sound may get longer and you get paradoxical splitting of S2. And of course, delayed carotid obstruct, usually in the younger patient. In the elderly, because of stiffness of the carotids, we rarely see that. So this is a nice example of uh, LV and central aortic pressure. And you can see that this delay upstroke here, 
produces a gradient that builds up more gradually. And that's why when you do a CW, you tend to have kind of a rounded picture. Um, you get a high velocity passing through, which is what we record with the Doppler. Male AS will have much less of, less of that phenomenon. Therefore, upstroke might be better compared to severe AS. Therefore, when you do a CW, tracing off the velocity through the valve, the milder ones tend to have a more triangular shape with the acceleration time being a little closer, takes shorter time to get from beginning to peak, where the severe have the more rounded picture. So in the echo lab, we often use this as a simple thing because sometimes you may get a lower velocity in the CW because you, you are not in the right place, best angle for the velocity, but you get that rounded contour, and that should be a alert that that AS can be severe. So we get gradients uh, in the echo lab. You saw the lectures before on echo. And then we get valve area. How do we do that? Because we can measure flows, right? So flow equals cross-sectional area times velocity. So if we can integrate that velocity times the cross-sectional area, that gives us stroke volume. And that's what we do on a daily basis in the echo lab. If you can measure the flow proximal to a, a valve that is tenotic, and then you can also measure those velocities. Because the flow is the same, you don't lose any stroke volume passing through that valve. You can apply what is called continuity equation. There is a continuity of flow volume passing through that valve. So if you already know the flow, you can change the equation around. And therefore, the valve area equals that flow divided by the velocity. And that's as simple as it is. So what do you do in the echo lab? You measure diameters of LV outflow. You integrate that to get a cross-sectional area. You get the integration of the velocities in the LV outflow, and that gives you a stroke volume. If you divide that stroke volume by this integral of the jet, you get the aortic valve area. And this was one of the very first publications that validated the method. And believe it or not, our current chairman, Dr. Zogby, was the fellow who wrote that paper. So it's a few years back. Um, it's been validated a thousand times, and it's what is done every day in everybody's lab. So um, what do you do in the CAS lab? Well, you guess what? The Gordon equation is also a continuity equation. Same principle. The only problem is that Dr. Gordon didn't have all the ingredients to be able to finalize the continuity equation. But the concept was the same. So what he did was, again, he, instead of looking at stroke volume, he, do, he, he looked at stroke volume at flow rate. So if you take the stroke volume and you divide it by the ejection time, you get the flow rate through that valve, okay? And what he wanted was to go from mean gradient, okay? He wanted to go from mean gradient to mean velocities. But in the 60s, when this was done, there were no Dopplers. So they did some engineering experiments, and they basically created this 44.5 um, because, re remember, you go, from <coughs> you go from velocity to gradient by squaring. 4v squared, right, gives you an estimate of gradient. So to go during reverse, you're going to do a square root. So you, you, see, you see how the thought process goes? So they did a square root of the mean gradient. They needed a fudge factor, and they played with a few numbers, and 44.5 looked good. You know what? They had like 10 patients. And that became the holy grail for the next, what? 70 years, whatever. I, I forget how many years has it been <laughs> since that came out, OK? So it's amazing sometimes how s some piece of research suddenly becomes like, this is it. You know, it's the Bible. So that is your Gordon equation. Same principle. It's based exactly on the same principle, OK? It's limited then by how well you can measure cardiac output, thermodilution, you know, FIC, whatever. And it cannot correct for AI because the measurements of output you're doing in the cath lab are effective output. So if somebody has a leak, you don't pick that up. Doppler, on the other hand, picks up everything. So with the Doppler method, you can correct for AI. In fact, every day we correct for AI. The biggest problem in the Doppler world is, again, the cardiac output, there are sources of errors. That if this was an echo, an echo talk, I could give you. And of course, you can also have inadequate recordings of that velocity of the AA. 
So both methods are subject to problems. And um, it's amazing how well some they correlate sometimes uh, when, when we apply them in, in studies. Now, remember, every LVR flow obstruction is not valvular AS. So keep that in mind. We have patients referred for TAVAR that had uh, subaortic uh, st membranes. So congenital subaortic membrane is a very important condition. Uh, easy to miss, but the aortic valve should look okay. Now, sometimes we get them both together in the elderly, and then that can be more challenging. The CW can look like AS because it is a fixed form of stenosis. Another one that if you see one or two in your life, you have, you have seen a lot, is supravalvular stenosis, which is a very interesting congenital disorder. Um, and again, those ones usually always have a very nice looking aortic valve. So it's a paradox is you get a Doppler of AS, you get a member of AS, but aortic valve looks great. So you have to start figuring, okay, what the heck is going on? And if you don't see anything in the LV outflow, look over here in the uh, ascending aorta. And then dynamic obstruction, which you know, is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with this historic anterior motion and the murmurs. And again, we for occasionally we've had patients sent for surgery for AVR who had uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So it, it is not impossible to confuse them. So let's talk about a little bit about what to do with these people, okay? So um, basically, the new guidelines for valvular heart disease um, have taken valvular disease and started them very early. Who's at risk for them? and then the milder forms, and then the more severe forms. So with AS, it's the same. A and B are basically people at risk for AS because they have some abnormality in their valve, or they're beginning to form AS. Mild AS, mild to moderate, moderate, and they're still doing well. So for the, for the most part, they have Doppler velocities before, below four, they have no symptoms, they may or may not have a little bit of thyroid dysfunction, or they may, have, they may be perfectly happy, and they have good EF. And you just follow them, follow them, follow them, follow them. Now you get into the severe years, which by definition is a velocity of four or more across the valve, mean gradient of 40 or more, valve area less than one, but most of the time it's less than, it's 0.7 or less. And, um, and very severe, which is a velocity of five or more. These people can still be asymptomatic. And then, but now you start seeing a little bit more effects on the ventricle, the asteroid dysfunction, some hypertrophy, and at this time, exercise testing can be very helpful because he may be a sedentary fellow, says he feels wonderful, you put them on the treadmill, three minutes or two minutes, they cannot go anymore. So this is one of the areas where treadmill is recommended because they have severe yes. They're telling you they're asymptomatic, they might not be. And then there is this group which we, you will see rarely. This is not a common group. Severe aortic stenosis, no symptoms, low EF. Very rare c condition, okay? But occasionally we do see them. Um, those always need surgery, as you'll see in a minute. And then once you get to the symptomatic group, you can have the typical severe high grading AS with symptoms. You may have severe uh, AS, but with a low output, low flow, low EF, and therefore the gradient is lower. Or you may have an interesting group that have a normal EF, but they have small ventricles, they have a low stroke volume, they also may have a lower gradient. So those are the groups at the end that we're going to try to talk a little bit about. For years it has been known that any symptoms are bad, so you always question your patients about any symptoms. Angina, syncope or near syncope, or you know what, I was working in the garden and I just got a little woozy. Red light, if it's, about, if, it, if it's someone with severe AS, Red light. I just have an 80-year-old, very asymptomatic, very robust man. That was his first symptom. He's on the schedule for TAVR. Or dyspnea or body F. And you can see that the prognosis is not very good for any of those symptoms. In terms of survival, those are very old data from a long time ago. But what about the asymptomatic patient? What do we do? Well, there's a lot of studies showing that overall they do, they do tend to do well and the sudden cardiac death is rare in the asymptomatic patients, particularly if you're seeing them periodically, if you're following them, if you're questioning them, if you're getting them sort of tuned into their own body, they, it's rare, it's not a common thing. What is common, however, is that within a short span, if they have severe AS, they will get to AVR. So when you look at these studies that look at event, whoops, event-free survival rate, it includes the need for AVR. So for example, in this study of 116 patients, only six died. 
most of them ended up with AVR. So the curves look terrible, but it's because of development of symptoms that pushes them towards AVR. And what they have found is that the higher the velocities, the more frequent that that happens. Okay, so if you have somebody with a 5.5 meter, you sometimes sit down and say, you know, why wait anymore? Within a year and a year and a half, you're going to have symptoms. Maybe we should think about it now because of this type of studies that have been done. Same way, severe calcification tends to go, tends to make them go sooner, okay? Um, and if the gradient progresses very rapidly, more than 0.3 meters per second per year, that also gets them sooner. So therefore, if you're symptomatic, you have severe ES with good or bad EF, it's a class one indication. And if you are undergoing, if you're asymptomatic and you're undergoing another cataract surgery, obviously that's a class one. If you are asymptomatic with severe AS, but you have one of these other findings that I just talked to you about rapid progression, it's a class 2B for AVR. And if you, are, you have moderate AS and you're going to undergo another operation in your heart, that's a class 2A. So and most of the time we practice uh, with these guidelines. So it's very important that we assess AS critically. This is the group that has a bad EF and low flow, and they can be a little more tricky. But basically, the important thing here to know is that if you can show some element of contractile reserve by dobutamine, they tend to do better. That doesn't mean that you should send the other ones to die, but at least you know that that group does a little bit better. And therefore, it's reasonable in symptomatic patients that have a low flow, low EF, severe AS, to recommend surgery or AVR if they have contractile reserve as shown by dobutamine. The problem is that now TAVR is changing everything. And in this very nice study done a few years ago, it showed that Tavar and Green had the best result compared to surgery. This is medical treatment or balloon. Balloon is just as bad as medical treatment. And likewise, EF improvement was the best with Tavar. So Tavar now is changing a little bit of how we think about these patients that have bad EF and severe AS, even if they don't have any contractual reserve. And stay tuned because these things are going to be evolving and changing. Finally, this group that has a small ventricle low stroke volume, low gradient, they have a class 2A indication only if they are normal tensive and if they are symptomatic. Why? Because hypertension is frequently associated with this, and in those situations, the recommendation is medical management first. But if they're normal tensive, symptomatic, and they have this condition of a low, small heart, low flow rate, and, and low gradient, then a class 2A consideration for surgery. This is probably one of the most tricky group of aortic stenosis patients that we manage today. So you're not going to learn all about this in one quick talk. It will take you a little while as you practice.